Top of page 13. You're right about that, the captain agreed. You'll never want if you're near salt water. It does for you, it does for you food and takes your place without waiting for no road. His last words draw Marguerite into sudden interest. She had been listening to the talk idly, her eyes on the on the endlessly parting waves that the Isabella B plowed through. Now she knew in a twinkling what the captain had meant. The sea was a road to a great watery highway going all around the world. Was the sea really a road? What comparisons does field make between road and the sea? Why do you think she does this? You had only to put out upon it and it would take you wherever you wanted to go. She smiled to herself, thinking of it so, likening the hollows between the waves to ruts and themselves moving over it in a coach without wheels. Now Dolly Sargent was dividing the remains of bread between the children, breaking it into as many parts as there were as mouths, as there were mouths, and smearing each piece with molasses from sweet-smelling wooden pegan. Caleb was sent to the milk the cow for Debbie who had awakened crying. Soon she was back with a hollowed gourd full, warm from old brindle. The neck of the gourd had been scooped and perforated to make a nursing bottle, and Dolly Sargent let the milk fat drop by drop into the baby's puckered mouth. Take the young ones out from underfoot, Maggie, Joel told her. I can't have them raising a racket hereabouts. And watch out, Patty and Jacob, don't gum them. Don't gam themselves all over with molasses, cautioned their mother, for Lord knows when I'll wash them clean again. They found a spot in the shadow of the, the settle and other household goods. Here, Marguerite returned to her wool winding, keeping an eye on the four beside her. Becky and Susan got their most cherished possession, a corn cob doll clothed and scrapped of bright calico while Patty bruised herself with a handful of shells, and Jacob pulled up imagery fish, imaginary fish, with a bit of a rope dangling over the side. This is the first time that Field has made reference to calico. So she's talking about a doll that's um, clothed in a scrap of calico. Take a moment to look up what you think she means by calico. Is she talking about the color? Is she talking about, um, what is she referring to as far as the doll's um, outfit goes? Go ahead and pause the video. Towards the evening, the wind changed. It was necessary to track and veer continually to make any sort of headway. Captain Hunt kept up, kept up his grumbling about their overloading and squinted wearily at the low bank of clouds the sun, the setting sun, turned to a fiery rose. Those there clouds are, let's say, he murmured, they'll mean no good to us. But for all that evening was fine and clear. Twilight held o long over the water, and with the sun down the air grew cool. After they had all eaten what remained in Dolly's basket, and the children had had a drink of milk all round, the three youngest went below to the tiny cabin. Their mother returned from putting them to bed on the hard benches. For a while, she sat with Marguerite and the twins, watching darkness come over the water and first stars appear. Very large and sharply pointed, presently Ira joined them, and even Caleb did not feel it beneath his dignity to draw near. There's the new moon, said Becky, pointing to the pale sickle that hung low in the west. I made a wish on it. So did I. So did I make a wish on it myself, Susan said, not wanting to be outdone. And they do say if you bow to it nine times, you'll get what you wished for. She began bobbing her head so fast that her braids jerked up and down stiffly. If I had my wish, said sighed Darley Sergeant. This boat would be ahead and back the way that we came from. Margaret heard Caleb sniff at these words, but before he could make any retort, Ira Sargent spoke up his slow, pleasant voice. 
Even here, tell about the moon and the powdered horn, he asked. An old man told me once, and he got it from Grandpa back in Scotland. Tell us, Uncle Ira, go on. The two little girls pressed closer to him, their eyes bright in the half darkness. It was this away, he told them. Once there was a man out hunting, and he went along, long way. So far he got tired from night, coming on and on and all. So he stretched himself out to sleep. But first he reached up and a hung his powder horn up on a light bright yellow hook that he see hanging right over his head. Well, he shut his eyes and he went to sleep, but come morning when he woke, his powder horn was gone. Look high, did he, and look low, and there weren't any sign of it. When did he do then, the twins asked together. Weren't nothing he could do, except gone home without it, their uncle went on. But the next evening, when it got dark, he went back to a place where he slept, and there right over his head there was a new moon, and his powder horn hanging on it, hooked, looked as nice, hooked as nice as could be. So he reached up, and he took it back again. Mercy, Ira, child Darley Sergeant, you had an odd to fill the heads, their heads with such foolishness. Take a moment to reflect on Ira's character. Why did he tell this story? Does this story have significance? Pause the video if you need to. Marguerite smiled to herself under the cover of the darkness. She felt glad of Ira Sargent and his stories. They made her think of those of Grammier had told her so often um, of an evening. She was sorry when he left with Caleb to help light the lanterns from a fire keep burning in an iron kettle. Notice the picture is our first picture of the story. It's about the story that Ira just told. Dolly Sargent went below, but the twins and she sat on together. Their bodies huddled close against the sea chill, their eyes on the star-spattered sky overhead. Many planets and constellations she knew from the nights when Uncle, Uncle Pierre had taught her to call them by name. These pointed out to the children, naming these she pointed out to the children, naming them over familiar, familiarly as would mention. I'm excuse, excuse me. I'm gonna try that sentence again. These she pointed out to the children, naming them over familiarly as one would mention neighbors. See, there is Mademoiselle Venus. Is she not beautiful tonight? And Monsieurie Orion with his belt of little stars. And Les Pilates over yonder. I'm sure that you can say that. Those names a little bit better than me. Presently their mother called the twins to come below. And Marguerite reluctantly followed. She would fall farther. She would rather. Excuse me. She would far rather have stayed out there as, as the men were preparing to do than creep between the sleeping children in such narrow box-like quarters. Even when she had settled herself on one, hard, one of the hard benches with her head on a bag of metal, she lay long, oh, awake long after the young sergeants and their mother were asleep. Excuse me for one moment. I had to shut the door. Okay. Even when she had settled herself on one of the hard benches with her head on a bag of meal, she lay long awake long after all the young sergeants and their mother were asleep. Though the open hatch could see a bit of the night sky, a fitful brightness came from the stern lantern as it swung into the vessel's motion. And now again, the moving shadows of the men showed as they handled ropes and shifted sail. She could tell from the sound of their voices whether they were talking among themselves or whether the captain had issued orders. Sometimes she heard Caleb also, his boyish tone shrill against the deeper tones, deeper ones of the three men. She slept at last only to waken to shouting orders and a great pitching and rolling. The Isabella B was behaving in a very different manner from her earlier one. Her beam shivered and shook. Her bows 
plunged, and reared, and her mast seemed about to be snapped off short of any moment. Sile, she cried, start, starting up in the darkness. One hand instinctively reached for her rosary beads, remembering in an instant that she no longer possessed any. She slipped from the between the children who lay in the warm heap of arms and legs about her, and she made for the hatchway. How she got up the steps, she did not know. Icy cold water poured down them, and the whole place was awash. The Isabella B was careening at such an angle that it was impossible to keep a footing except by clinging to the rails and inching along. She could make out the figure of Joel Sargent crawling in the fashion to join Ira, who was struggling to reef in the canvas. Captain Hunk Hunt, excuse me, Captain Hunt clung valiantly to the tiller through waves swirled up, the waves swirled up and about him till it seemed he must have swept away with the earlier fresh deluge. As he threw his weight against the tiller, he shouted out the orders to the others, but the noise of wind and water was such that even with deep sea voice sounded faint and broken. Make the stays fast, Marguerite heard him bellowing. Then, and then the next moment when he caught a sight of her, it was, Below! Keep below there! She would have obeyed had it not been for the sudden shrill cry from the bow. Caleb and the livestock were in trouble. She knew this without the splintering wood and the terrified lows and bleats to warn her. Hardly realizing what she was doing, Marguerite sat herself to go forward. Flattening her body against the side of the cabin, she edged along, clinging with one hand to the low wooden rail, embracing her bare feet against any board that could help her keep a foothold. Whatever headway she gained, she must make in the second of the lull between waves. They swept over about her, flinging her no filling her nose and mouth with salt water. The wind whipped at her braids, her wet braids, but she hung on. The men shouted to her. She was past heating. Halfway along, particularly high wave washed over the straining bows, burying them in spray. Seeing it upon them, Marguerite lowered her head, flinging all the strength that she had into the grip of her hands and her feet. Then came another sharp cry from Caleb, and she looked up in time to see a white mask swept overhead. She did not need the agonizing, agonizing bleeding to tell her what it was. Caleb's makeshift pen had been washed away, but the forward rail still held. Somehow he had managed to lash the cow and her calf to this. By twisting his own body between the ropes, he felt himself from going over the side, while with both arms he struggled to hold three remaining sheep. Earlier in the day, their legs be had been hobbled, the four the hind ones being tied to, to, together to keep the animals quiet. Now this only increased their helplessness. They were like so many bags of wool at the mercy of every wave. Even as Marguerite crept nearer, there came another lur lurch, and Caleb had lost his hold on one. Without knowing how she did it, she freed one hand and clutched at the woolly body. Take a moment to summarize what's going on on page 17 through 18. You can pause the video. Keep a hold, she heard Caleb shouting in her ear, and she dug her fingers tighter in the thick wool. They could barely make each other out in the dark and wet, but the whiteness of the sheep helped mark the places where they clung. Now and again, in any sight lull, they shouted a word, or show, or so, to show that they still hung on. But for the most part, neither had had any breath to spare. Ah, my arm, you'll twist it off, gasped Marguerite, as the sheep struggled in panic of animal terror. She caught her lips between the teeth, lest Caleb should hear her crying with the pain. After a little, it did not hurt so much. Either the sheep had tried it, had tired itself, or she had grown used, gone, grown used to the strain. She felt very cold and numb and almost too spent to be afraid when the Isabella B took some specially high sea or plunged from the watery height to hollow, and then it was over. 
The squall passed with almost as, as suddenly as it had come upon them. The wind no longer tore and tugged at the rigging, and in the early light of morning the sea grew quieter. Iris Sargent was the first to reach them. His face looked pale under his sunburn, and he peered over the wreckage to see if they were still there. Without a word, he took the sheep from Marguerite's hold, leaving her to craft off, to crawl off. She would scarce she could scarcely grip the wooden rail and her fingers so cramped that she was too soaked to care that a foot of water slopped about the cabin floor with every lurch and roll. Never lauded on a scene that pair of young ones alive. She heard Captain Hunt saying to Joel as she stumbled down the hatchway. Well, I guess Caleb would stick fast, the other one answered. But why she ain't got to bottom traspin' out there in the blow is past me. She's got grit. Wherever she's raised, I'll say that for her. Yes, she's quite a craft, that girl, the captain added. And then he shouted orders to Ira about letting out more sail. Marguerite tumbled into a heap on the hard bench below. Stop and pause. Can you add anything to Marguerite's character? What does the word grit mean to you? The children whimpered on all sides, and Dolly Sargent scolded her for her rashness. But this was nothing to the inner glow that she had felt that she felt as she remembered the words she just had heard. The captain had praised her, and Joel Sargent had admired, had admitted that she had grit. Perhaps even Caleb would be less scornful of her now. She fell asleep and dreamed herself back in Le Havre in the sunny garden of the convent. The sisters were moving about in their soft blue robes and starched headdresses. They were like crisp white wings and the chapel bells was ringing for noonday mass. She awoke with a dull ache in her head and a body so stiff it was all she could do to keep from crying out as she painfully climbed from the dark cabin into the brightness above. The sun stood high overhead, and the sea was so smooth and blue, it seemed impossible it could ever have buffeted the Isabella B. so fiercely. But all were signs of that struggle. Part of the for forward railing was gone. One of the hen coops and more of the half of the precious household goods had been washed away. Dolly Sargent sat in the midst of her young children, mourning the loss of her possessions, in no certain terms why her husband reminded her that it was a mercy that they all hadn't followed them to the bottom. What does that line say about Dolly's character? She was mourning all her possessions. Top of 21. You'd best be thankful we saved three of those sheep, Caleb told her with pride. But for Maggie and me, there wouldn't have been a, a snag of wool left. And what are sheep good to me without a spinning wheel, she answered him shortly turning one of the of the quilts the better to dry in the sun. But for all her fault finding, Dolly Sargent was easy with her bound out girl that day. She set her no tax tasks beyond looking out for the children, and even gave her a bit of tallow to rub on that great bruise that had risen on her forehead. Already it was turning a deep purple, a sight which seemed to gratify Caleb. May, he said, I'm sorry, my, he said, but you're easily battered. Guess I'm a tough bear, or I'd be black and blue all over. Oh, hush up, his Uncle Ira told him good-naturedly. Whatever it was that struck her weren't a no farther. Feather. <laughs> there, being only enough milk for the baby and two of the younger children's behind some card tack, the men set out to find other food. What would you say to taste of Marblehead turkey, suggested Captain Hunt. Wind's light enough to spare two hands from the rope. Marguerite looked at her in amazement at these words, and Ira smiled as she, as he and Caleb brought out hooks and lines. Even the twins were less ignorant of such matters than she. They soon explained to her that it was codfish they were after, not wild fowl. With some hoarded bits of dried fish for bait, they cast their lines over the side and soon Several speckled cod and haddock, or two, were flopping underfoot. Meantime, Joe Sargent had 
rekindled a fire in that old iron kettle, sacrificing a stick or two of wool from the broken hen coop, which had been drying in the sun. It took him a good while to whittle off shavings and to get these alight with his flint and steel. But at last it was blazing well in Dolly's spider heat, heating in readiness. Caleb was an old hand at cleaning fish, and soon they were ready to eat. I'm going to stop here for a moment, pause, and you can go on to the next video.